prevalent management thought is that we need to reduce the variance. We do not want differences. Good management, Six Sigma, is getting rid of variance. Right? But I'm telling you that you want to be a person who's creating variance. It's the only way that you can be innovative. We're talking about innovation, right? I'm going to come back to this thing. Um, we live in this world, but we are not belong to this world, right? Um, I, when I was in Cleveland, I had a, I had a, um, you know, old gentleman at our church. He was a master of taekwondo. At his house, he had a rabbit ear TV antenna, which captured rarely any American station. But then he had a dish uh, network that has like seven, eight different Korean TV channels. He had no idea about what's going on in the U.S. He never reads Korean at the American news channel. Never reads, but he knows everything about Korea because he's completely tuned in. He's a rebel. <coughs> he's living in this world, but he doesn't belong to this world. <laughs> you see what I'm saying, right? Um, we need to be like that. We, we are governed by the rule that no one else sees because we are tuned to God's passion, where God's heart is. Because God is actually looking at the whole world. When you do that, you actually have really, really good idea, even from the people who live in this world's perspective. That's what I learned. You don't really need to work really hard to discover good ideas. You just need to think about what God wants you to do, where God is now, right? If you uh, look at uh, the book, uh, Bible study book, uh, Experiencing God, uh, Henry Blake, you, right? So rule number one, God is always working. Just that we don't know where, where is that. So how do I catch God's vision? Just look around. Right? You will discover God is doing something. And then join Him, right? And then that will confront you. Because God wants you to change. And you change and then you can experience God. And that's what Henley Black will be talking about in, um, in that book. And then Purpose Driven Church. Uh, Warren, um, what's his name? Rick Warren. So he said, uh, you know, vision is like a surfing, right? We do not create wave, we just catch wave. And so I'm talking about all the same thing. And those who look at those things are crazy people. Right? When Microsoft says one thing and everybody else is going that way, Steve Jobs had a different idea. And he was like 10, 15 years ahead of his time. And that's why nobody understood and he got bankrupt. He, got, he was driven out. But he was right, right? Now, of course, you know, it was temporary because of human eye. Then later, you know, 20 years from now, his idea was wrong again because it's not fashionable anymore. But God's idea is not like that. So we need to think about it. So in the management we call Blue Ocean Strategy. Right? So what is Blue Ocean? Um, some of you read this book, right? Blue Ocean Strategy is that you're competing where no one is competing. Leave that bloody red ocean. <laughs> Go deep in the blue ocean. Create your own world. Number one ice cream um, uh, retailer in the world, Baskin Robbins. They are number one in every world, every country in the world, except one country, South Korea. <laughs> number one, I don't know whether it is true or still, you tell me uh, from Korea. Number one, um, a few years back was red mango. How was red mango succeed? Uh, this is red mango store number one in uh, Iwa University, in front of Iwa University. Red mango uh, noticed a couple different trends. 
Number one, people are health conscious, so it's yogurt based ice cream. But the second thing that the owner noticed is that kids, today's kids, so kids noticed, uh, she noticed the kids, after they could decorate their ice cream with toppings, Korean kids take photos. <laughs> they, there's a ritual, right? It's as if they have to pray. <laughs> <laughs> and then she also noticed that people struggle to get the right picture because of the interior lighting condition is not so good. So either you get blurry photo or you get flat photo. If you use flash, then you get this flat ugly photo. If you want to get ambient light kind of thing, then you don't use flash and then you get blurry photo. Nowadays camera is much better so you can actually take good, uh, good shot. But way back then, it was really good. It was very difficult. So the major innovation that she did was not ice cream. Major innovation was interior lighting. Every table was equipped with floodlight. That, if you go back, that floodlight is the most, and then focus on the table. That is the most important innovation of this store. It has nothing to do with ice cream. She discovered the unmet needs of these kids. And they were celebrating something. You know, you get together. And they were mem you know, um, creating the memory of that meeting by taking pictures. And they had a hard time. Said, you know, I'm going to solve that problem. I'm going to give you the flood, uh, flood light on the table, and you'll get a good picture. Baskin Robbins, on the other hand, they still wonder why they, you know, why they lose their customers. We can bear ice cream. Ice cream is not the reason that they come. It's the flood light, right? Who is Nintendo's competitor? No. <laughs> it's a problem with having, having two screens on my computer. Uh, this is actually the chairman of the Nike set many years back. The, our competitor is not Adidas Reebok. Our competitor is uh, Nintendo. Why? Because when people... So what is their product? Their product is not selling shoes. Their product is killing time. So uh, kids are killing their time in the past with uh, basketball, but now they are not doing it. They are killing their time with games. Nintendo is killing our business, so we need to do something else. So they actually changed the business model to uh, fashion. So it's all about urban fashion. It's not about basketball anymore, if you have noticed about Nike. So they are like a special shoes and you know uh, rare shoes and all sorts of stuff. I have a high school boy, a senior, whose hobby is collecting Nike shoes. <laughs> I learned it in Harvard. It's about competing competition of ideas, yeah, like I said. What defines your business? And you really need to understand people's mind. The point that I'm making here is this. In order to understand people's mind, you need to understand God's mind. Because understanding people's mind will give you a certain competitive edge. A better and enduring way is actually understanding what God wants to His people and serve His needs by doing it, you can serve their needs. And that is much better way. I'm just illustrating the worldly example how business becomes successful by not serving your need, company's need, shareholder's need, but customer's need, right? This is what good business is actually learning, right? We are discovering our, who, who are we serving. Nowadays, you know, design is becoming one of the key words in the business world. Design and art are two different things. What is a key word in design? It's a service. And I have a friend who is a design theorist. What's the difference between design and art? Artist does things for him or herself. It's the expression of her and his ideas through that art of art, artistic expression. Design shares a lot of it. But at the end, it needs to render service to the customer. The whole point of design is serving others. And no wonder it is a good idea. Why? Because it is God's idea. God wants us to serve others, right? So you can apply the same design principle in innovating your own organization when 
Organization is designed to serve each other's need. It's a good organization. When organization is to serve others, it's a good organization. You know why iPhone is successful? Because iPhone ecosystem is designed to serve others, called developers. When IBM and AT&T and Verizon first opened up their app stores before iPhone, they took 90% of revenue. It's not serving others. We call it ripping off others. <laughs> Docomo was very successful because they gave 70% of revenue to uh, developers. First time in the world in telecom. Telecommunication industry is notorious for uh, control and they do not share their uh, revenue with their suppliers. Docomo said, well, we don't know what we are doing in terms of application development. You work all the hard work, so we will give you 70% of share. We take 30%. We think that's fair. It was very successful. They sold the technology to AT&T Wireless, which doesn't exist anymore because they got bankrupt. Uh, and now it is different AT&T, right? But that AT&T said they had a different idea. They said, we're going to take 70%. And we got a 30% to the developers. Nobody wanted to develop for AT&T. So there was no apps for AT&T. So it sucked. It didn't succeed. So I actually sat down with Japanese Tokomo Aimo executive. And I asked him point blank, why do you think this didn't work in America? And he said, without hesitation, because American managers are stupid and greedy. <laughs> right? We gave them something perfect and they just turned it into ugly thing. And Apple said, no, we're not going to do it. We're going to share revenue. We're going to give 70% to the developers. And so all of a sudden, the developers said, this sounds really good. We're going to develop apps for Apple. And then, uh, you know, telecommunication company didn't understand why they're successful. Why they have hundreds of thousands of apps there. Microsoft has three or six at the time. <laughs> Because serving others is a good idea. Why? It's because it's consistent with what Bible is teaching us. The world is just catching up. The future of a car, BMW's idea of a car, is the ultimate driving machine. So if you are in the business of designing car, do not even try to build a driving machine. Because BMW nailed it. And they know how to build a car that gives that excitement of driving, right? That's the driving machine. Probably Porsche could do better, you know. Uh, other than that, for you know, regular mainline consumer cars, no one can compete with BMW on that basis. So what others do, they say, oh well, car is a moving computing platform. That is Audi. So Audi puts more computer into the car than anybody else. Their car computers are everywhere. MIT said uh, car is an urban uh, transport. This is actual prototype that they built, funded by General Motors, before ba General Motors got bankrupt. And their idea was that a car, so uh, Frank Gehry was actually the design consultant for this project. Frank Gehry came to them and said, and I media led to this project, Bill Mitchell, Professor Bill Mitchell did it. He's not an auto uh, designer, he's an, uh, he's an architect. So he had a whole bunch of MIT students, computer science, and you know, uh, mechanical engineering, of course, but uh, mostly architects and urban planners and so on, economists. They get together, got together. Bill uh, and uh, Frank Gehry came. He said, reinvent the wheel. I mean, that's uh, the, the mantra for management. He said, don't reinvent the wheel, right? But he said, reinvent the wheel. And he went, everybody, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, reinvent the wheel. So, yeah, let's be creative. Let's think outside of the box. So they tried to be creative. He came back after six months, came back and said, I told you to reinvent the wheel, I and mean, you didn't reinvent the wheel. Then he went back. And then the MIT people said, oh, maybe he really meant to literally reinvent the wheel. So they, they decided to reinvent the wheel. So this is their concept. The car doesn't have an engine. The car doesn't have a, uh, has any uh, gears. Uh, everything is in the wheel. Each wheel is a robot with independent control logic, engine, battery, everything is in the wheel. So four wheels are put together with a central control computer. <coughs> so independent robots controlled by central unit. Uh, so because there is no, no transmission gears, the car can collapse like a shopping cart. So for a space where one sedan can be parked, 
they can park seven of them. Mm. And then it's charged through induction uh, in the city. And you use credit card to get on. Uh, and then uh, you drop where uh, the next uh, transportation station is, the public transportation station is. That is the idea. The car can be assembled in 50 minutes in a board boardroom. And so MIT students actually build a prototype, flew over to Detroit. They carried all the parts in their carrier luggage. <laughs> and they went to the boardroom. They start assembling the car. And then uh, board members worried that they will be sued by the labor union because executives are not supposed to do the assembly. <laughs> and this is how how rigid and stupid American managers are. And then they didn't do anything with this technology. They funded the entire project and it has been shelved. Uh, this uh, is a prototype uh, from a um, Saab which now is bankrupt successfully by General Motors. I worked on that project uh, and Saab has a model which will be never built because now it is bankrupt. Um, that has Android inside the car, first time. Doesn't have CD player, doesn't have radio, doesn't have anything, no navigation. It has Android with a big screen. Uh, and they create an app store. They show the car to Google, and then, oh, we're busy killing I iPhone. Um, so we will come back, and then after that, we have a TV. And maybe after that, you know, we will do something about car. So they said, you do what, you know, whatever you want to do with this Android in a car. It took uh, 12 years for them to invent that thing, uh, completely funded by GM. When GM was spinning off Saab at, uh, Saab at the uh, uh, finance, during the finance crisis, Saab managers went to GM and said, do you want this? And they said, no, uh, we are just too busy. We're just, I mean, do you want to take this to a new GM? Said, no, 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 no. So do you know that if we are successful and, and, and if you want to use this, that means you need to pay us license fee? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, so they, they completely gave up this new technology that they invested on and walked away. Now, you know, it became very successful. The product actually uh, launched not last year at uh, Vienna Motor Show. Uh, and the Chinese government wanted to save the company and wanted to invest on Saab. And then GM, still owned major share, uh, refused investment because they worried the Chinese company will take their technology. So they essentially killed the company. Um, because of uh, blocking the uh, other company's investment. But anyway, that's a long story. Uh, but uh, anyway, so what, what am I saying here? You know, the car is not just a car. Car can mean many different things, right? Toyota, uh, for car, is all about sustainability. Right? For some people, car is all about uh, status. Car is never just a car. Car can be many different things. And therefore, uh, the job of managers is responding to those needs that they discover and then make products that meet the needs. So it's all about verb. You know, it's about activities that we do, not about a noun car. It's fixed. Noun is fixed. Verb is open-ended. We do things with verb. Um, so the question is, like, what is your verb? A company as a company. What what thing do we do, and uh, and what kind of product do we create to serve the needs? And the needs is often expressed by their verb. You know, this is what I ask people management when I teach uh, companies like, are you a noun company or are you a verb company? Do you own a verb? You know, because if you um, when, um, when my son, oldest, the youngest son, was uh, seven years old, I had very interesting experience. Um, I was working at home, and he brought his friends. And his friends were uh, very curious because I was at home. So they said, uh, what does he do? <laughs> and I was very curious what my son would say. And then, uh, he said this, he teaches other people how to make money. <laughs> I think that's a good, good answer. And then he added, but he doesn't know how to make money himself. <laughs> That's my son. <laughs> so I teach people how to make money. And it's very simple. There are two ways to make money. You have an idea that no one else has. That's Apple's model. Or you have the same idea that everybody else has, but you do it better. That's Dale's model. 
you know, we had uh, Michael Dell visiting us, and someone asked him about intellectual property, and I just couldn't contain myself. What intellectual property? They don't have any, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because it's a, like commodity. Um, but anyway, so uh, idea is very important in business, right? But idea is expressed in words. Wittgenstein once said, um, the limit of my word is limit of my world. Okay. If you do not have enough, so when you go to Alaska, Eskimos have like how many different uh, words for different snow and color white? In Korea, you know how many different uh, words to express different parts of cow, beef, because we eat every part of cow, <laughs> you know, and so we have different way, like that is this, and you know, <laughs> who knows, right? And then Japanese people have so many different words for tuna. Which is all tuna? Teddy tuna and bread tuna. <laughs> you have to, you know, but they have, you know, many, many different. Why? Because their world is richer about tuna than ours, and that is expressed through their word. So, how do you own the world? You all want to own this world as a God's children. How do you do that? You own a word. Your own vocabulary is very, very important. Right? So when Xerox owns the word Xerox, they own that world. When, when Google became an everyday word, they ruled the world. Right? When you pay FedEx, I was actually talking to FedEx, and he said, oh, you can FedEx it. I mean, I meant UPS. And he would be like, hey, do you want to FedEx it overnight? Yeah. So, I mean, UPS. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know. But we don't UPS it, right? <laughs> so if FedEx is doing better than UPS, we know that. So uh, um, when you want to own the world, you want to create your own word, and you better create your own verb or own a verb rather than a noun in this world, right? Google became a verb, that's very significant. Um, now, so how do you do that? Well, you gotta be able to see what is not there. You know, we're in the business of creating the world. So, this is what my design students did. They went out and studied um, two photos. One is existing, and then they saw what is not there, and then they visualized it. And then they say, how does that look? They said, that looks good. Then it becomes a product. Right? That's what we do, what designers do, what inventors do. They see what is not there. And by doing it, you invent new verbs, and also either you transform the meaning of what we know. Um, but then, you know, what I learned about innovation is that we have this kind of crazy idea that innovators are always trying to innovate. What I found is that innovators are not actually interested in innovations at all. Innovation is a very bad idea. Because people are all trying to become innovators and you cannot innovate when you do that. What innovators actually do is they are trying to solve a problem. And in doing it, they become innovators. Innovation is an outcome. You do not innovate. You solve problems. And when you're successful, and you become innovative. So I'm going back to way, 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 way uh, from the beginning of the second part. So how do you find the problem? Right? Choosing the right problem is so important. Now in the medical field, they have a big problem. Cancer, that's a problem. So they always just like invent solutions, innovate on, and, and because the medical industry is so big, we just think that that's how we should all do. But real innovation is not coming from so innovating new things. Solving the problem is how you do this. Right? Choosing the right problem, good problems, the problem that God is concerned about. That's what you should all do. So how do we do that? Well. We have to be humble. In a business world, I, I say it's a solution agnostic. The problem of business is that they all have their own toolkits. 
and they want to use their own solutions. And that's the wrong way, right? So I have, I know something, and I want to brag about it, and that's why we build business. And the moment you said you know something, you're not going to be good at it. Always focus on meanings, you know, why people do what they do. What does that mean is that you really become humble observers of people, right? So this is a picture I took in um, Tokyo, um, subway station. Uh, that's in Juku. Um, I always forget. It's the busiest uh, place where all the young people, uh, everybody's having mobile phone looking at okay. This is really interesting, right? Now, do you know who this person is? He's a computer scientist who invented MP3 technology. Nobody knows who he is. You know what this is? This is world first MP3 player, proudly invented by a Korean company. Nobody knows who he is. So the first one, this was a science. It's not what business people do. This one was an engineering work. It translated science into engineering work, created first product. And this is iPod that we all remember. This is business work. So solution is not important. I mean, the, 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 what we use, inventing new solution was not the answer. It was finding the problem and then putting together solutions that others have already created and delivering it to the right people. That was the solution. Right?